Welcome to Equipping Leaders, a podcast where I share and discuss resources, tools, and information to equip leaders to build creative, cohesive teams through culture and leader development. Welcome to the Equipping Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Natasha, and today I am sharing a conversation that I had with leadership coach, Zach Mierva, on coaching while being in a position of leadership. Coaching is a valuable skill for every leader, and whether we're leading others or developing future leaders, focused coaching sessions can allow us to reach more people. Typically, a coaching session has a somewhat structured format and lasts anywhere from 15 to 90 minutes, depending on the person and the situation. However, learning to ask the right questions, cutting to the heart of the matter, and empowering people to stand on their own is the function of a leader and a coach. So good morning, Zach. How are you today? I'm great, Natasha. How are you? I am wonderful. So would you please introduce yourself and tell us your style of coaching? So my name is Zach Burba. I am a military officer who's currently transitioning out, make, making the big leap from uh, from here, teaching at West Point down to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So kind of exploring in that space. Background is a, an armor officer, and I got my master's degree in organizational psychology from Teachers College, Columbia University. So my, my kind of style with coaching, part of our program when we went through grad school via West Point, the Eisenhower Leader Development Program, was developing our own coaching model. And so while I was trained under the Columbia coaching model, uh, I, I kind of created my own and I'd say I've actually stayed pretty true to it, to be honest. Uh, and so I, I was literally just reviewing it like a little bit ago just to kind of re myself. So I, I, I called it the Leap In model. And so it's an acronym for learn about them, expand on the issue as much as possible to facilitate conversation, assess themselves and their understanding of like how ready are they and then plan with them the next step which can include smart goals etc and so like how are we getting to the next meeting what are we kind of like actionable steps we're doing to get from now to the next time i see the the individual and then part of that like kind of the next so that's like the initial meeting and kind of when you when you do your contracting and stuff like that and then you move into like inquiring so how are we getting back to how'd you do like how did you how did you go about accomplishing the things that we set out to to do together? Figuring out where their progress, progress is, any new information about where they're at, uh, and then establishing new goals. So you've got the leap and then you've got the in as like the subsequent events. I love that you created your own framework essentially for how you approach coaching. Were there any frameworks that you used as a leap off point? Yeah, I mean, Dr. I mean, you know, Dr. Malpia definitely shaped a lot of how I look at coaching. Just some like incredible people that helped facilitate. Just so many people that I was observing at TC, in particular the ones that were not in the military. And so the folks that I got to learn from that had professional experience, you know, non-certified professional experience to talk through and had been doing this in industry. And so I found that super interesting to engage with them and learn from them and their approach. And really what it came down to and realizing, I think we all as as a whole, the ELDP cohort, so the the, the officers going through the program, kind of had this idea that like, oh, civilians don't understand. Like people don't understand about what we do. And so there's no way they can help us. And that kind of became a metaphor for coaching as a whole, where you don't need to know the ins and outs of the industry of which your, your client is, you're supporting through. Like, so I could be a coach for, you know, some C-suite executive in an industry I've never even heard of before and still provide value. And so that was just something that's so important. So kind of just picking and pulling and coming back to the idea that most of what I found was effective was just understanding where people are coming from and then listening and and all those listening skills that you learn uh, to hear in between the lines, like how, what is underneath the surface that, you know, what versus what's presenting versus what's really underneath. I appreciate that perspective too, because John Maxwell, in one of his books, books, he was talking about how they had these coaches who coached skiers. And then they took those coaches who had no experience with tennis and they had them coach tennis players. And the tennis players really improved and really liked the coaching because the coaches knew how to ask the right questions. They knew how to ask them questions that really made them reflect and think about what they were doing and why. And then they 
figured out how to self-correct. So I really love that piece where it's like, you don't need to have this in-depth experience of what someone else has gone through and have lived through it, because this isn't mentoring, right? This isn't something like that. This is coaching. And it's really moving people from one place to the next, you know, wherever they want to go. Yeah, and, and I'm curious your perspective on this too. Like, have you kind of found as you've been coaching people that as they explain that mindset or where their their worldview is coming from and maybe their industry, it helps them kind of like surface those problems themselves, which I guess is a huge part of what coaching is. But have you found that too? Like I find that all the time. Oh yes. It's interesting because you don't want to go like too much into the past because you're not, you know, we're not counselors in those moments, but it's really interesting when they're talking, which is what you want them to be talking most of the time. And then all of a sudden, they kind of start to, you can see like their eyes start to move and their brain is just really figuring something out and to kind of like sit back and watch them in that space and watch them talk through that for themselves is really, that's always a really cool thing. Because it's also showing them that like it's in them. These things that you need are in you. And as the coach, I'm just, I'm walking alongside you to help ask questions to help bring that out. So with coaching, do you coach externally or are you like an internal coach to your organization? So primarily with, with where I'm at at West Point and, and my positions that I've held here after getting formalized training and coaching, it's it's been internal to the organization. Although I have done some external work with people while I was in grad school. And so we worked with, with a healthcare company and was help, you know, helping some of their leadership coach them through some problems or that they were having with their organization. So that was beneficial for me to learn from. And again, I think it reinforced those, hey, you don't need to have any experience in the healthcare industry or any industry to provide value for them. You're that second set of eyes that's questioning and learning and helping bubble those things up to the surface. But with my role now, I kind of call it, I, I'm trying to for, like figure out the term for it. I don't know if it's uh, if it's moaching or whatever. It's like that smash together concept of mentoring and coaching that I think is just part of what it is to be a leader in the military. And so having like having discussions and I, I primarily focus my energy on, I have a lot of uh, mentees or the, the way I look at it, coaches or, you know, clients that I'm helping coach through problems, typically women, and people of color. And then also I have a lot that are some you know, individuals going through difficult times. For example, you're at West Point, you get assigned a coach, a developmental coach, when you are going through like an honor board issue or you've had significant military inf you know, infractions. And so I, I tend to get, I tend to tackle those problems and, and help or tend to tackle those clients and then help them understand their own underlying problems and come to realizations of where they came short so that it's coupled with the coaching, but it's also a lot of mentoring. I know I'm a senior officer to them in position and rank and everything else, but I try not to approach it that way. I'm trying to learn about them and how I can help them get to the next level and rebound stronger from where they left off. It's so interesting too with an internal, I feel like that internal coaching challenge is across all industries, right? Where it's like you are more senior and as a leader, you also, you want them to be successful and especially the leaders of the future. With developing leaders, especially future leaders for the military who do have to really encounter difficult challenges themselves, are there opportunities that you have found internally for them to get coaching outside of the honor type issues. If somebody's just like, I am looking to, I wanna be the superintendent before I retire, right? The superintendent of West Point. And what would, what would that look like? What would that path be like? How do I need to develop? Are there those kind of opportunities at West Point for cadets not assigned a developmental coach? Yes and no. I would say that a lot of the problems that we have here is, is is getting to the middle 80%. And so those are what I, the term that we kind of came up with as a group where it's like, you've got your top 10% that you're gonna see because they excel. They just, they, they bubble to the surface, they come up. You see them because they're getting awards, they're your senior leadership in the cadet world. Then your bottom 10%. So your folks that are getting in trouble, that are having issues. And, and so you naturally engage with those, the top and bottom 10%. But that middle 80 is the ones that were cadets like me, where, I just kind of survived. I didn't get in trouble. I didn't really excel at anything. I was I was just kind of a run of the mill cadet. And so if I wasn't actively seeking out mentorship, then 
it could blow right by me. There are cadets here that will never really interact in a positive way with a leader unless they force it themselves, just because it can, it can run right by them. With that said, we have some things that are put in place at the academy and that I think are beneficial for, for anybody. Because I, I think that problem probably exists elsewhere. It's not just here, I'm sure it exists in corporate America as well. So how are you getting to those middle folks? How are you creating some sort of deliberate developmental plan that gets after getting people to the next level? And so some mechanisms that we leverage here are we have kind of a, it's a pseudo 360 evaluation system where a select percentage of every instructor is given, hey, I, I think I have six cadets this semester of my 37. So whatever percentage, math, I'm not a math guy. Soft science is all the way. So when you look at that number, like that percentage, I am now going to sit down and I'm going to conduct a counseling session. And again, for me, it always comes back to coaching. And so how am I, I'm having a discussion with them about where I saw that they excelled, where they struggled, how I can help provide them some feedback to get them to the next level. And so that exists here. And one of the reasons that I love what I do now, which is teaching military leadership, is that we force the cadets, uh, because we need to, to, to get a mentor. So we have to have them sign up and they sign up with a mentor and they're all proofed by every instructor. And they write papers based on identifying who they are. So fundamentally, the two papers are identifying who you are and how you will lead. Those two, the journey line and the leadership philosophy or leader philosophy paper. All of that is backed with discussions that are expected to be had with their coach, with their mentor. So they're getting those those mentor interactions naturally through that or forcibly through that process. And then part of my lesson plan and my focus in my courses is is reflection. So how are they integrating the lessons that they've gleaned from their mentor in those sessions, applying them and thinking about them and writing about them. So you get kind of multiple levels of, of reflection and growth there. And so the challenge of course, is everyone's different. Every cadet, you know, every every leader is, is reacting and coaching and mentoring differently. Uh, and they're not all created equal. And so that's part of the struggle. Some of them just, I had one came to me not that long ago and said, you know, sir, when I sat down with my mentor, they, they didn't even look at me for the entire 45 minutes. They just stared at their email. And I was like, I got I got pretty angry about that, to be honest. So so that's kind of how we approach it here. If we really be more deliberate about how we have mentorship and how we the socialization process of an organization, when you bring somebody new in and I think it's called serial serial mentorship, where you have someone assigned early on and they're paired up for this duration. So. I think that's really impactful and I think that can help people develop a lot quicker in an organization. And I think it's so awesome that they're forced to get a mentor in this class because I think that a lot of people don't develop along their career and in their life because they don't know what, how powerful the mentorship relationship is and they don't know how to find a mentor. They don't know like kind of where to look or how high up in a chain to look. I have met people though who didn't even occur to them to talk to somebody more senior in their organization or in, in a field they even want to be in. Yeah, that's why it's so important to, as an organization, you have to establish that. That's part of your onboarding process, in my opinion. If you want to, and, and I'm very much focused on you know, the people are the solution to your problems and how, you, how you're how you developing them shows that you care for them. It shows that you're you're investing in them and they're gonna invest back in you. I, I know you, as a leader in, in the military, and I'm sure you've seen this before, like I found that that little bit of like transformation, talk tra transformational leadership in you, that little bit of individualized cons consideration, that little piece of, hey, like how are, you know, this thing in your family or this this little piece or this little, hey, I'm gonna take care of you and do this thing, it comes back in the organization tenfold. And so like that investment, there's a risk in corporate America that, hey, we're gonna leave, you know, that person can leave. If we put too much money into them, we get them additional training and, and qualifications and they get, you know, Lean Six and they get Scrum and they get Agile and they get all these things. And then the counter to that, that I learned from the folks at Next Jump is, you know, but what if they stay? What if you don't get them better and they just stick around? The trick there with all of that, I think where mentorship and coaching comes into play is if you create that culture that that's that important, that you care about your people enough that you're gonna be doing those things, they're not gonna to wanna to leave. They may have those opportunities, but and, and you're just now creating more and more incredible people that are just gonna elevate your organization.
And if they do leave, why would it also not be an amazing thing to be a great company to be from? And if you really care about people and developing them, you'll care about that piece too. Absolutely. And then, and then what happened? And so now what are the second and third order effects of that is now you've got people that like great people are wanting to come because they realize that, hey, I spent some time here. I'm going to be a better leader, a better person. I'm going to be more effective. And so like maybe you are losing people at that five, 10 year mark. But in that time frame, you've got incredible high performers. So when I when I picture those high tier firms that I've I've talked with and engaged with, it's those, I think that's a lot of what they do is high performer. You know, you, you spit out the other end, the back end, these incredible people that go on to do great things. Example off the top of my head, Ingenuity, right? Cause she was at, at BCG, if I recall. And so now I'm sure that there are countless people that look at her example of like, I want to go there too, because I can be like her. And so to me, that's just, that it speaks to your exact point. And I remember, I believe it was Amy Marson. She had made the comment that when you care about people, you're showing them how to care. What I love about that is that it's so accurate. When you show people how to mentor, and I'll just use the example you used earlier. If I, if somebody comes in and I'm mentoring them or I'm coaching or, or doing whatever, and I'm not paying attention to them because I'm on my email, I'm checking my, I'm doing these other things. I'm teaching them how to, how to mentor, how to do that. And hopefully they wouldn't, then do that to someone else but they also you set a precedence for that behavior and what is and is not acceptable so they could move forward and do that but if you have a great mentor if you have an organization that cares about its people in a bunch of different ways then those people like you said they give back to the organization but then they also really take care of each other and that's where you get that really great culture of people don't want to leave because they just really love where they are and the love they love the people they get to be with Absolutely, 1,000%. One, 1, also, in having so many cadets, and then also team members sometimes who need coaching, have you had to do any like on-the-spot coaching? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. I think a lot of this assignment in particular, for, I guess for some, some additional context, a lot of what I did prior to coming here, and especially prior to going to grad school, was tactical level stuff. Down in the dirt, hands dirty, interacting with people, follow me kind of stuff that we're gonna we're gonna walk each other along the way um, and so in coming here I had to figure out how to take a step back and and be that organizational level leader how am I now empowering my team to take the things make the ideas their own and kind of get in their get in their brains that this is their idea this is what they want to do and I can I'm just coaching them along the way and that was a totally different mindset. Like I was very focused on my individual, like kind of counseling sessions as an as a, as a commander and in below, we're still kind of coaching, still trying to figure out their goals and how I can help. Very ineffective, mind you, as I've reflected on that. I was not, I was not good at it by any means, um, but that was always where my mindset was. But I was still in execution. I was still the one in front for the most part. Here, I had to figure out how to be in the shadows and putting other people in front and whisper in their ear and kind of give them that little bit of guidance. And so I found like this, this assignment at West Point, especially as a TAC officer, was so incredible for my personal development of how, how do I get the intent out there, but kind of like implanted in someone else's mind. And it's been a really fun challenge of like, you know, the classic leadership is getting people to conv you know, convince people that they came up with their own ideal. Uh, and so, it, it, seeing that happen and just kind of literally standing back there with the cadets that are making those decisions and like hey and you know them look to me and i get to look back at them and be like hey let's see how it works out you know and then when they they may fail they may struggle they may fall down a little bit but we pick them back up we and, and ask the question all right what did we learn what did we learn from that experience and so that was it was part coaching in the process but then also part mentoring where it was hey in the future, like we've learned by doing now, let's, here's a different way to look at this. Here's a second effect, a third order effect. And that was just a lot of fun. I am just literally envisioning the times where we were doing training events, insert 
the hundreds of things. <laughs> but standing in the back of a formation with a cadet who is the one who's planning it or the, you know, the, the person in charge and just kind of like, all right, well, what's the next step then? Because they, they would very frequently, and I think a lot of people do this, they don't think of the next step. They're just executing right now. Mm -hmm. And so like, hey, what's the next step look like? Oh, I, I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah, you should probably be thinking about that. And then having them vocalize it, it was those little micro coaching engagements that were super fun. It's really interesting too in those situations where I, I like to say that like when I'm coaching, whether it's a micro session or it's a whole session, I've never worked harder at doing nothing than in those moments, especially when you see what someone's about to do and you're like, this is going to be insane, right? It's going to fail. It's going to be bad. But to also understand, especially at Westwood, they're in a training environment. This is the opportunity for them to figure things out and to let them have their own ideas, good, bad, or indifferent, and see how it plays out, and then see how they use their resources. Absolutely. And that's and that's what makes it fun. It's infuriating at times, <laughs> especially like our job where it's you know, I'm like twitching in the back, like, no, you don't do it that way. But then the counter to that is always, and this is what I've, I've been preaching since I've been here, is that and it's the same way with soldiers in command or as a platoon leader or an XO or whatever, all the stuff I've done, is that you think you have the best idea, but then somebody else comes up with a great idea and that you never would have come up with. And that's just so much, it's so much fun. I love that when any, you know, quote unquote subordinate comes up with a brilliant idea and you're like, damn, I wish I would have thought of that, but I'm really, I'm really glad that you did. And so that's really fun for me personally. I, I take a lot of joy in seeing people succeed and coming up with those creative solutions. I know that when I was at the cyber schoolhouse, we would have interactive activities. And then at the end, I would ask two students who I knew had different solutions than mine to present. And then I would also present mine because I also wanted people to see that there were many different solutions. And I would say 100% of the time, their solutions way better. They were so interesting and the way they kind of went about it was all their experience kind of going into you know these technical solutions people will come up with their own way of doing something as they're figuring it out sometimes you're like if i had had that mindset when i was that age where would i be right now that's amazing yeah, that person's going someplace <laughs> that person will be the superintendent before he retires <laughs> yes absolutely so this has been really awesome do you have anything you want to promote first and then second how can people find you if they want to find out more about what you're doing I don't really have anything to promote, but feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, and that's uh, Zach Merva, M-I-E-R-V-A. Uh, you can't miss me. I've got my, my big happy smile on my LinkedIn profile. I'm exploring just personal reflection in my transition in a public way. And it's initially started as an opportunity for me to hold myself accountable by public writing. So every week I, I publish my, my reflections, the things that I did that week, did I accomplish my goals, inspiration, gratitude, stuff that I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm keeping myself on track. That's what it all started, but it has turned into something bigger than that. It has turned into people reaching out to me that have you know, hey, that I didn't realize this resource existed and I'm gonna use it. It's turned into, hey, I, I'm also thinking about getting out and this is making it feel a little less uncomfortable and to see somebody else going through it in a public way. And it has made, it, it's kind of like breaking every, every bit of the massive life change I'm about to go through into one week at a time. And it seems a lot more manageable that way. So every week, every Friday, roughly around noon, give or take, I, I publish a new article. I think I'm at the 13 now, 13 or 14. And so just trying to keep consistent with that. And, and it's just been really helpful. And now what it has turned into is it's sort of my brand. And it's also speaks to a lot of what I've been trying to do the last couple of years is, you know, shared vulnerability to create psychological safety. And so that's a lot of what I've been doing in the classroom is, hey, let me share my challenges, my struggles in a public way so that you all don't feel like, I may seem like I got my act together, but I'm going through stuff too. And I think there's strength in that. So that's that's the big piece. That's awesome. And I love those posts because like you said, we think so optimistically and people like you and I who are just very, like we're very ready for that next step. And we do all these things to prepare. And then you realize that there are actually 10,000 other things 
And when you look, it's that whole thing, like how do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. And so, yeah, to have those little chunks of, okay, I really need to think about these things. It's not going to be as easy or as difficult as I thought it was going to be. In this episode, Zach and I spoke in depth about developing leaders and the coaching tools and mindset that make that endeavor successful. To explore these concepts more for your own self-development, I would invite you to journal about a few questions and a quote. The first question is, as a leader, what are some moments in the past two weeks that you could have handled with more coaching questions? And second, how would a coaching program empower your organization and the people in it? The quote I have for you is from Jade Adams, who said, we don't need leaders. We just need loads of people working together to make sure everyone else is all right. Thank you for listening to this episode of Equipping Leaders. All of the resources mentioned in this episode can be found on my website, natashacheyenne.com, as well as timestamps to help you get right to the resource that you are looking for. On the website, you can also find a weekly leadership journal entry, a resource page with challenges and downloadable content, a place to sign up for my weekly newsletter, and an upcoming leadership platform full of workshops. You can also follow me on Instagram at novel underscore Natasha and on Twitter and Facebook at Natasha Cheyenne. If you'd like to hear more about a specific topic, please reach out and let me know. Join me next week for another episode.